Well, good morning, Pioneer Drive. It is good uh, to be with you. And this morning I am grateful for our team of musicians. I am grateful for our technology team, for Samuel Cummings and for Gina Wheeler and, and Matthew Jungling and Andrew Wheeler and Donnie Vanador who are here this morning uh, to ensure that you can worship wherever you are. Uh, these are challenging days. We've heard the term unprecedented. This week, I have spoken on the phone with church members who have uh, loved ones in the hospital whom they are not able to see. Uh, husbands and wives, uh, daughters and sons concerned for their loved ones battling COVID-19. Uh, the big country is in serious shape, and these are times when we all must join together uh, to work together for uh, the good of our community. And Thursday morning, with a plea from Hendrick Health System, one of our sister Baptist institutions. Um, I called several other pastors in town and other community leaders, and we said, we've got to do all we can. We must do everything we can do, knowing that in the end it still will not be enough, but we must do all we can. And one of the neat things I saw this past week was I saw the big country being the big country. Abilene being Abilene. No one forcing us to do anything, but community leaders, businesses, nonprofit leaders joining together to say, how can we serve? And so one of the ways we can do that right now is to meet virtually uh, in big group gatherings for uh, a time. I don't think this is going to be 10 weeks, but who knows? But we can do this virtually for a time and continue to worship Jesus uh, so that the virus does not continue to spread uh, through our actions. Our heart here is to be a blessing unto the big country. And so today, uh, we pray for those who are suffering, uh, we pray for the sick, and we pray for our community leaders, our healthcare workers, and we certainly pray that our hospital system is able to uh, maintain its critical mission uh, during uh, these days. Thank you for your flexibility. I know our change muscles have been uh, stretched uh, beyond anything we uh, care to stretch them. I think we're ready to be done and have some ease, and I understand that. I certainly am too. Uh, but these are the days we're living in, and these are the days of faith that God has called us to. And you know, Jesus is still on the move. We've seen God on the move in so many ways here at Pioneer Drive over the past few months, uh, even in the midst of days of challenge. This past week, uh, we were excited because uh, we were able to share with our church the work of our Building Improvement Steering Committee. They've been working now a couple of years, praying and discerning where God is leading us as a church and our facility to accomplish the vision that God has for us in the big country. We've had a subcommittee of Wayne Carr and Angie Wiley and Lisa McFall and Gary Milliron and Jordan Hibbs working and working with architect Park Hill Smith and Cooper. Uh, last year when we presented Pioneer Possibility to you, uh, we shared with you that we were thinking that the price tag would be around $4.6 million and we raised money and you pledged over $5.7 million to that project. Uh, this past week, we were able to announce that we, as a church, have awarded uh, the construction contract to Collier Construction, and uh, their uh, price that we are uh, signing on to, total with the architect fees, uh, is $4.1 million. This is a hallelujah, uh, praise the Lord moment, uh, nearly half a million dollars cheaper than what we were anticipating. We still have some other costs to incur, fixtures, furniture, that kind of thing. Um, but we feel like the Lord is, is looking down on us and leading us and his hand is upon um, this church. You've already given to date, uh, combining what we had from our last building campaign, $2.2 million. So before we even begin construction, we're over halfway there to paying uh, off uh, this project. That is absolutely remarkable. Uh, call your plans to begin the first week of January, Lord willing. So there is a light at the end of the tunnel. There are exciting things to look forward to. I know there's also, I believe, we're going to round a corner soon on the virus, uh, though we have some challenging days ahead. I just want you to know, I believe God's on the move, and we're going to have to continue to be patient uh, with one another, uh, loving, grace-filled. We may disagree on things, but, but we, we rally together and we unify around the mission 
of Jesus Christ. And I believe that mission is alive and well today in the life of Pioneer Drive Baptist Church. You know, the the book of Hebrews talks about faith. Uh, That faith is confidence in what we hope for. It's the assurance of what we do not see. That that faith is for those times when we we don't have the answer. Faith is for those times when we don't have a blueprint. Faith is exactly for those times when we don't have a roadmap. When we don't know which way to go. That's when you need faith. And when you look in, in the Bible, there is no story of faith without a struggle of faith. There's no fruit of faith without the feet of faith. I was talking with a longtime church member who said, you know, back in the 80s when we built our children's building, uh, right after we we did that project, oil just tanked. And we probably would have never done the project or waited a long time to do the project, but we stepped out in faith. This is another season, Pioneer Drive, where we step out in faith and we trust that the Lord is holding us together That what unifies us is not a building. What unifies us is not our our seat in the pew. What unifies us is not our our time on Sunday morning when we're physically present. What, What ultimately unites us is the common connection and purpose we have in Jesus Christ. This morning, we're going to wrap up our Jesus on the Move series, I would say season one. Uh, much like a, a, your favorite television shows, ours in our house, This Is Us, you know, they'll, they'll at the end of the, the season, they'll, they'll leave you with a cliffhanger. We're going to kind of be left on a cliffhanger today. We're going to pick Jesus on the move back up as we prepare for Easter uh, towards the middle part of the spring. But if you have your Bible, I'd encourage you to turn uh, this morning to Mark chapter 9. Story is told of uh, Franklin Roosevelt, who often endured long receiving lines at the White House. He complained that no one really paid any attention to what he said. One day, during a reception, he decided to try an experiment. To each person who passed down the line and shook his hand, he murmured, I murdered my grandmother this morning. The guests responded with phrases like, Marvelous! Keep up the good work! We're proud of you! God bless you, sir. It was not until the end of the line, while greeting the ambassador from Bolivia, uh, that his words were actually heard. The ambassador leaned over and whispered, I'm sure she had it coming. (laughs) In our text today, I don't think the disciples were hearing Jesus. They sure weren't understanding Jesus. Mark chapter 9, we'll begin reading in verse uh, 30, and I'm going to invite you to stand. Wherever you are, if you can do so safely, uh, we invite you uh, to stand for the reading of God's word. Mark chapter 9, beginning in verse 30. They left that place and passed through Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know where they were because he was teaching his disciples. He said to them, the son of man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days he will rise. But they did not understand what he meant and were afraid to ask him about it. They came to Capernaum. When he was in the house, he asked them, what were you arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet because on the way they had argued about who was the greatest. Sitting down, Jesus called the twelve and said, Anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. He took a little child whom he placed among them. Taking the child in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. Thank you. You may be seated. So Jesus is on the move, and he's foretelling his death there in verse 31. This is the second and most succinct instance of Jesus foretelling his death in the Gospel of Mark. These passion predictions get to the heart of the matter you see here in chapter 9. They speak to what is going on, that Jesus is getting handed over. They speak to what Judas will do, which is betray Jesus. They speak to what Jesus will do, that he accepts his death. They speak to what the authorized will do, which is they will kill him. And they speak to the outcome of the events with which Jesus will rise again. 
that Jesus would come along and fulfill the role of the suffering servant that was prophesied in the Old Testament. Now, in verse 31, you see a a reference to the Son of Man. That's a connection back to the book of Daniel. A, A paradoxical statement here because you would think that the Son of Man would exercise authority over them. You would think that the Son of Man would not have to go down this path. But time and time again in the Gospels, you'll see what humans think, what the disciples think, is not really what God's up to. God's up to something different. You see there in verse 32, But they did not understand what he meant and were afraid to ask him about it. The disciples' response, it's one of incomprehension and fear. Incomprehension and fear. They weren't hearing. They were not understanding. The disciples had obviously asked Jesus some tough questions before, but you just have to wonder in this text if the disciples really wanted to know the answer to the question. Think about the disciples. Earlier in Mark, Jesus would speak in code, and they didn't get it. Jesus would use parables, hidden messages, deeper messages. They didn't get it. They really struggled to get their minds around the the, the fact that Jesus often wanted them to look beneath the surface, and now he wants them to take it literally. He's about to die. No one thought a Messiah would die. It's like a football player that that ties up their legs for the Super Bowl or an instrumentalist that neglects to bring their instrument to a competition. No one thought a Messiah would die. The disciples had lived life with Jesus. They had watched him, but they just didn't get it. They, They weren't understanding. God's saying something to them, and they aren't listening. How do you listen for God? How do you listen for God? It's maybe something you've heard in Scripture, something you hear in your prayer time, something you've heard in church. Are are, are you open to God speaking to you? Are you open to having your ways of understanding how God ought to work transformed by a new work of God? How are you at listening for the voice of God? Robert Heron, I'll paraphrase, he said this. He said, good listening is like tuning to a radio station. For good results, you can listen to only one station at a time. Trying to listen to my wife while looking over an email is like trying to receive two radio stations at the same time. I end up with distortion and she ends up frustrated. Listening requires a choice where I place my attention. Uh, To tune into my partner, I must first choose to put away all that will divide my attention. That might mean laying down the phone, moving away from the dishes in the sink, putting down the book I'm reading, setting aside my projects. Present with God, present with people. How do you listen for God? New Testament scholar N.T. Wright Stated, it is only when we slow down our lives that we can catch up to God. It is only when we slow down our lives that we can catch up to God. That's a paradox in the Christian life, that that we live with an intentional commitment, a relentless commitment to slow down. That worldly values of of power and value and, and priority can easily start to take precedence in our lives and not allow us that time to slow down, to catch up with what God is doing. One of the ways we can do this is silent prayer. This is just one one tool we have to to, to truly be still and to, to not say anything. Sometimes I'll set a phone timer for two minutes or five minutes. I've even gone as long as 20 minutes or or 60 minutes where, where you just set a time to just be. You don't try to accomplish anything. Just like a married couple that's been married uh, quite a long time. They can be with each other. They can be fully present. And they don't even have to say a word. This is different than just being mindful. This is different than New Age meditation. This is a communion with God himself. A connection with our creator. Taking time to just... Be, that, that amidst all that is going on in the world, 
all the chaos, all the voices we listen to on social media and our favorite news networks and our family and our uncle's opinions and our aunt's opinions and our parents' opinions, our friends, slow down and hear from the Lord. Oh, we desperately need to hear from the Lord in days like today. That yes, we absolutely can tell Jesus our burdens. We ought to, we're called to, but have we... Slow down enough to listen to what Jesus is saying about our burdens? Have we slowed down enough to hear his voice? We're often apt to see the, the ben, to look for the benefit, to look for the quick fix. We, we skip reading the whole manual thing and just go jump in all in without taking time to, to think that the disciples were just jumping in. They, they, they were skipping this whole die to self thing. They were skipping this whole let Jesus lead thing. They, they, were, they were jumping to their assumptions for what the Messiah would do. They thought they already knew what he meant. They weren't paying attention. How are you paying attention to God? It's not going to happen by accident. It'll happen when you're intentional and you slow down to catch up with God. Another way we can listen for God is a slowed reading of Scripture. You may pick a passage, maybe a verse, maybe two, maybe three. Try not to make it, make it too uh, lengthy just so that you can focus. But you may read that text one time. And, and the first time you read it, just ask yourself, what images or words jump out at you? Reflect for two minutes or so, just quietly. And then read the passage a second time. And ask yourself, what, what's God doing in the text? What's God saying? in the text and reflect for two minutes or so and then read the text a third time and ask this question what is God's invitation to me slow down and, and read the scripture to truly begin to go to the rhythm of the spirit these are just a couple of practices that can help us slow down and pay attention to what God's doing the disciples were not hearing and they were not understanding And Jesus gets the glimpse that maybe there's been a little tension here. Verse 34, he asks them, what are you arguing about? What are you talking about? They were arguing about who's the greatest. You see on, in the conversation around sports figures, the, the goat, the greatest of all time. And when I was in sixth grade, I had a task to write a persuasive paper. And at the time, I was all in on Hakeem Olajuwon and the Houston Rockets. And I thought that Hakeem Olajuwon was just constantly uh, gypped by the national media, uh, that Michael Jordan was not the greatest player of all time. It was only because he lived in a major media market like Chicago uh, that he was considered the greatest and that Hakeem was really the greatest. And so I set it out to convince the world through this sixth grade persuasive paper uh, that Hakeem Olajuwon was the greatest of all time and that Michael Jordan was just a sham. Well, I got a call. My mom got a call from my English teacher. Said, John wrote this paper and it just sounds kind of whiny and complaining. How about he come in and rewrite the paper? and pick a different topic. So I came in and I wrote a paper on how my parents needed to get me season passes to Splashtown. <laughs> and she approved that one. They're arguing about the greatest. Who's the greatest? They're concerned about their status, about what's in it for them. And there, today, there are many, just like the disciples, that that are concerned about their own prestige and their own sense of worth and, and their own bank account balance, it, that they just miss what Jesus is all about in the first place. You know, Jesus doesn't rebuke the disciples for wanting to be first. He just flips on head how they understood being first. Verse 35, the way you're first in the kingdom is by being a servant of all. Conventional standards are, are overturned that, that Jesus' followers are awarded not for their achievement of positions and power and preeminence, but 
for their service to others. As Jesus is headed towards the cross, foretelling his his death, he's turning upside down everything the disciples had, had imagined. He's turning upside down how many Christians even still today think that somehow just by being close to Jesus, even somehow working over time, makes them more special than others. So think about it for a minute. What if Jesus were to turn to you and ask you what you're talking about? What are you talking about? What's on your mind? What's on your heart? What are you spending most of your time talking about? Is it of eternal value? Is it worldly pursuits, temporal pursuits? Is it the downward way of Jesus? Is it dying to self so that Christ may live in us? You see, if we aren't hungry for Jesus, it's probably because we're too stuffed with ourselves. You know, the inconveniences of 2020, having to meet virtually... uh, Two years from now, five years from now, we're going to remember this. We're sure going to remember how we treated one another and whether we had a posture of service to one another. But we're going to get through it. We we will. But some of us in this season are, are too stuffed with ourselves to think about how we can serve Jesus and how we can serve our neighbor during this time. As we celebrate Thanksgiving uh, this week, Thanksgiving is not just a day of the year for the Christian. It ought to be an entire mentality and an entire posture uh, of the heart. And entitlement breeds stinginess, but thankfulness breeds generosity. When we spent time with Jesus... When we begin to understand more and more of what Jesus is doing, our hearts are overwhelmed. They're filled with the goodness and with with the greatness of God. Where the heart, uh, Scripture tells us, speaks what the mouth is full of. And we become generous to people and we become ready to pour our lives out and say, how can I serve? How can I put myself and my needs backseat to my neighbor's needs? Jesus is challenging the proud. You know, the proud, they didn't have time for children. They, They shunned children. They, they couldn't give them any honor back. There was nothing in return. There was no ROI or return on investment for caring about children. But Jesus said, when you receive a child, when you receive someone who's vulnerable, when you serve, when you lay down your rights and your privilege, you welcome them. Not only are you welcoming them, you're welcoming God himself. way of service. You know, children weren't rated highly in the ancient world. No status, no prestige. But that's not what Jesus' followers are after. The disciples, they were looking for their benefit package. They were ready to sign on the dotted line. They were concerned about who was making more money than whom. They, they, were, they were hanging drapes in the Messiah office complex. They were worried about paint colors and and where their office was going to be in relation to Jesus. And Jesus is having to reframe their entire mission. They thought proximity to Jesus would mean worldly power. Power, privilege, position continue to be the quest for many today. But as one scholar noted, privilege is being able to live your life while having the choice to avoid other people's pain if you so choose. Jesus' followers don't avoid the pain of others. They don't deny the pain of others. They love others. Jesus said, when you receive a child, the vulnerable, those who can't pay you back, you receive me. Are there things you won't do for Jesus? You might not say it out loud. You might not want to tell a friend or a spouse or a child or a parent about it, but probably all have those things. We say, you know, I'll do everything but. When Eli and I were in college, we said, 
we'll go anywhere but not Abilene. <laughs> and look where we are. are. Are there things we won't do for Jesus? Jesus points to receiving a child. That's, that's what this kingdom's about. It's about service. When I was in high school, we, several of us were providing leadership uh, to our uh, youth ministry in the absence of, of a youth minister. And I had there's kind of this moment when there became a little bit of tension of who's in charge. And, and we had some different ideas about how to move forward. And our, our senior pastor at the time, uh, Dr. George Watson, called us uh, all into his office. He set up a, a meeting and, and we thought he was going to, you know, kind of set us straight and kind of referee. Well, what he did in that meeting was fascinating. I didn't know it. He'd already ordered towels and he already had embroidering put on the towels. And he had my name on the towel. And he had a reference to, to Matthew's version of this account where, where the way of the Christian is, is to serve. It's Jesus washing feet. It's, it's being a servant of all. It's saying, I'm here to serve. How can I help? How, what, what can I, I do? What, what does it look like? How do I wash feet? And so uh, after I received this towel, it's been in every office I've had. Uh, it's, it's a call to remind, remind myself as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ that, that, that I'm not here so that others can serve me. I'm not here for my own fame or for my own position. I'm here to serve. And that's going to mean it has a cost. And that's going to mean it has consequence. And that's going to mean at times it means people are going to be critical. But I'm here to serve. And that's our call as Christian. Our call as a Christian is to say, how can I serve? When a pandemic is raging, how can we serve? What can we do to love our community? How can we be a blessing? The way of Jesus, this road to the cross, is a way of emptying out our rights. Not looking to our own interests, but instead looking to the interest of others so that Christ may be glorified so that Jesus Christ may be honored. And that's how we're going to get through challenging times, just like we get through successful, fruitful times, is we are going to be people who serve. First Peter chapter 4, verse 13 says, but rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. Recently, my friend, a pastor, senior pastor of First Baptist Church of Brenham, Texas, Ross Shelton, we get together periodically with other pastors in the state, and he shared something on Facebook that I, I did not know, but he revealed that he was one of the many thousands of people that was participating in a vaccine for COVID-19. This intrigued me. I, number one, how do you get involved in doing something like that in Brenham, Texas? And why would you do that? And I found his statement there in his announcement. He said, I did this because I wanted to find a way to serve during this crisis. I am fortunate to be in good health. And I thought this might be a way to serve it. It also aligns with how Christians have historically responded to pandemics. We have asked, how can we serve and sacrifice for our community? I know there's different opinions on vaccines and all that kind of stuff in the world, but I was just really impressed that he was willing to be injected with a vaccine so that it might be helpful and might end the pandemic. We're not all called to do that. But we are called to the way of the towel, to the way of service, to the way of laying down our rights. It's a kingdom where, where the last shall be first. It's a kingdom of servants under the lordship of King Jesus. What does it look like for you to pay attention to Jesus and follow his example? Who benefits? Who benefits because you follow Jesus? Who, who will hear of Jesus' love this week through you? You see, we're, we're called... Not to be a, a cesspool of God's blessing, 
We're called to be a conduit for that blessing that God has given us, the love, the acceptance, the grace that God has given us to flow through us and to go to the world, to go to the people all around us. And if, if we're followers of Jesus, other people around us ought to benefit. Other people around us ought to sense love and mercy and grace and truth and righteousness when they're around us. How, how this week will you embody that kind of service? It's Thanksgiving week, an opportunity to be with family. Maybe your Thanksgiving looks a little bit different this year, maybe a lot different. How will you serve? How will you love one another? How will you defer to one another? As we have opportunities here in the big country, how will we serve? How, how will others benefit because we follow Jesus? You see, this isn't something we do in and of ourselves, but it's something God gives us the strength to do. And so here in, in rural Galilee, we've seen Jesus on the move. We've seen Jesus initiating. We've seen Jesus forgiving. We've seen Jesus multiplying. We've seen Jesus challenging. We've seen Jesus on the move, purifying, calling people to enjoy the goodness and greatness of God. We've seen Jesus on the move in so many ways. And the good news is he's not done moving. In our intro video, we've seen every week, every week Jesus is still on the move. That, that God, in rural Galilee, through a Jewish carpenter turned teacher and prophet, God was preparing the way for the salvation of all humanity through the death of this one man. That, that salvation would not be achieved as an exercise of power or coercion, but through love and self-sacrifice. You know, like those disciples, we may not always fully understand this mystery either. We may never understand it fully. But the important thing is that we keep following Jesus on the way to Jerusalem. Pioneer Drive, Jesus is on the move. The Pioneer Drive, don't let anybody tell you otherwise. Big country, to the watching world on live stream and Facebook, Jesus is on the move. He's on the move, so let's keep moving with him. Let's keep moving with him. This week, challenging times, difficult days, times with family, times at work, time with friends. Let's join him on the move. Would you pray with me? Jesus, we're grateful for the opportunity to go through your word. We're, we're grateful for the freedom to worship. We're grateful for the freedom to connect. We're, we're thankful, Lord, that we have the opportunity to serve our city, to love the big country this morning by worshiping at home. But Lord, help us this week we so easily can get caught up in worldly pursuits, talking about things that aren't of eternal significance, things that are temporal. So Lord, help us this week to reframe our mission towards service and love of you and love of neighbor. Lord, we can't do it on our own strength. We're gonna stumble, we're gonna fail. But Lord, we're so grateful for your mercy and for your grace. We're grateful that you love us, that even when we mess up, we get a do-over, we get a second chance. Thank you for this church. I'm thankful for the ways in which you're working and you're on the move through Pioneer Drive. Lord, help us in these days. Help us to stay connected. Help us to minister to one another. Help us to put the needs of others above our own. Help us to glorify you and all that we say and do. Thank you for being on the move in our lives and in our church. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.